que era esto se muere de nuevo. Ay, dale mis gracias. No, no, no. Para ganar hay que mirar al rival. Por eso a mí me gusta jugar con mala gente. Es gente como uno. It's not about It's not about It's about the police killing us. A mí me pueden decir lo que me quieran decir, pero yo nunca me, me detengo, ¿sabes? Eso es algo muy bien característico de los cubanos. Nosotros no paramos. Mi mamá me decía que llegaría la revolución. Desde entonces yo la esperaba con miedo y el pueblo con esperanza. The two cops that killed Mahajan's good blanket received medals of valor. More than 125 years after the massacre of 300 of my people, they are still giving medals for killing Indians. They're powerful enough for the journey. You must be powerful enough to return. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here to moderate tonight's presentation, our discussion following the, the screening of the film Savage Land. And first, I'd like to uh, introduce myself by just letting you know that I'm here in New York. Uh, Robert Vetter, I'm here in New York, of Long Island. I'm on lands that were originally occupied and taken away from the Montaukett people. I have with me Campbell Dalgleish and Dr. Henrietta Mann. And I'd like to just briefly tell you about them um, and a little bit backstory to the film as well. Dr. Henrietta Mann uh, has served an entire lifetime in education. Um, she was a professor for many, many years at Montana University. She also was part of the founding of Cheyenne and Arapaho College in Oklahoma. Campbell Dalgleish is a professor at CCNY. He teaches filmmaking, and the two of them are the powerhouse behind the production of Savage Land. Tonight, we'll have an opportunity to answer some questions that all of you might have following the movie, which I, I hope resonated for you. It's certainly a very impactful film. It looks like we also have Melissa Goodblanket with us. Melissa, you saw in the movie, the mother of Mahavitz and a very powerful person who had some very important messages in the film as well. So while we wait for questions that uh, you, the viewers, might have, I'd like to begin with some questions of my own. And I'd like to begin um, with Dr. Mann, who I know a lot better as my my sister. <laughs> so, so Henry, The first question that I, I think the film poses early on, one that is kind of troubling, I think, to the viewer, is the relationship between Native people today and Christianity. And the reason that I say that it's troubling is, for example, in my own life, you know, my background is as an anthropologist. That's what got me in Oklahoma in the first place where I went to graduate school and where I would eventually develop all these relationships. But in going to Oklahoma, the thing that troubled me, I think the most when I first got there was my discovery that native people took so well to Christianity because in my own mind, I thought to myself, if I had been abused, if I had been traumatized in the way that all of the tribes that came to Oklahoma were, and I had been had Christianity forced down my throat, would I be able to worship in that way? And for me, I had to answer that question, no. And it it's something that I think is very difficult for non-Native people to understand. Do you mind weighing in on that a little bit? I will try to make it succinct, but that would take a week of classes, actually. Uh, thank you for asking me a question that I feel very strongly about. And let me begin by saying that as one of the Hamawotstanil, the indigenous peoples of this land, we have always 
had our deeply rooted spirituality based in the earth. We believe we have spiritual roots that go down into that of our mother, grandmother. And as we mature, they go down even stronger and stronger and stronger. I believe that it is that type of spirituality that has helped us to succeed and withstand the genocide and the attempts of assimilation beginning, of course, with the church, with schools, and with the federal government. It makes this whole matter of having two ways of looking at the world. I would like to make another comment that says, to the effect that we, again, as this land's indigenous peoples, really have a, a respect for the freedom of religions. We let anyone pray to their creator in their own way. But it was the intent of those three institutions that were established on these homelands that forced Christianity upon us and primarily through education of our students who went to schools located on reservations and schools located off reservations, the first of which is Carlisle. Indian Industrial Training School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The curriculum consisted of three areas, a very rudimentary English education, learning how to speak, read, write, and nothing more than that. A, then there was the matter of being trained for second-class domestic work, the women being trained to develop their skills in baking, cooking, being homemakers. The, the, the males were sent out to plow the fields, to milk the cows, to till the soil, to be carpenters. But the third prong of that educational approach was Christianity. So that those early schools, we can certainly say, were religious training schools. They begin by indoctrinating the young people. And so consequently, uh, the government was very harsh. The churches were very harsh in trying to, quote, save our souls when our souls had been saved from creation in terms of the way that we pray and worship. And so sometimes there is that kind of pressure, especially if our children are trained in schools and Christianity, and they brought those kinds of teachings back from those schools from them, with them, then in order to make sure that we survived and were not again confronted with tragedy, genocide, and outright massacres like the, uh, the massacre at Sand Creek in uh, Colorado Territory or along the Washita River in what was Indian Territory. You learn to make sure that you do the right thing to protect your children and your family. Black Kettle, who signed at least three treaties with the United States government, said he signed those treaties. And I'm sure along with that, we can say accepted the kind of Christianity that was forced upon us, who ironically had left the Europe of that time, fleeing religious persecution. And they came here to put us in that situation. But Black Kettle did say, all I ever want to be at peace with the United States of America and to buy buy into his institutions is I want my children to sleep through the night. Thank you. Beautiful answer. Um, yeah. I want to welcome Melissa. Melissa, I, I kind of want to ask you the same question before we get to some of the other subjects of the film. Um, because when we talk about the Native American church, we we often bring in the name of Jesus. So the same question goes to you uh, in the film. 
there's a section that explains very, very br briefly what the Native American church is. So if you don't mind, if you could just explain to our viewers a little bit more about what it is and how it is that Jesus is in that teepee. Well, good evening, everyone, relatives and those watching. Um, that's, a, that's a loaded question. I understand that um, Jesus was always in the teepee before we even knew the name Jesus. The teachings were always already in the teepee, founded on love, faith, hope, and charity. That's the foundation of our Native American church, wherever you may find it, wherever that teepee is sitting up. Love, faith, hope, and charity is the foundation of our sacred circle. And when we gather, there's no one above the other. We're all on the same plane, regardless of who we are, where we come from, what we may or may not understand. We are in there to pray as one. Our Cherokee people, we, we say, Gaduji, uh, helping one another, community. Adogashti, we are all one. We meaning everything. We are one with everything. The environment, the earth, the sky, the stars, the moon, the sun, the plant people, the stone people, the sacred waters, the elixir of life. It is all one. And so human beings, you know, we were here, as I understand it, to take care of our environment and our beautiful, marvelous blue planet, this earth. We are stewards of this planet. And what we do to her, we do to ourselves. How we treat her the ultimate will come back to us. And so I might say that humanity, you know, has made a pretty big mess of things. When compassion and integrity, respect for all life is hard to see, hard to feel, this movie Savage Land, those things were absent the evening that my son's life was taken here. There was no respect for life shown, no compassion. Those things have to be returned. We have to restore it, revision it, bring it forth again. For all life to thrive in balance and in harmony. And so when we go into this Native American church, that's what it's all about. It doesn't matter what language we speak, what color our skin is. Everything is represented in there. The mineral world is represented in there. The birds, the sacred animals is represented in there. Everything is represented in that sacred circle. And so we gather under love, faith, hope, and charity in our Native American church, wherever the teepee is up. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Campbell, I, I wanted to make the the next question uh, one for you to tell a little bit of the backstory of the, the film, because, you know, it, in very much along the lines of the conversation that you and I recently had, when 
you see the eye of the camera and the camera is focused on a number of different subjects, the question always is who is standing behind the camera? What is their intention? What is their purpose? What is their agenda? What is it that they're doing this for? So I thought that maybe a, if you could just you know quickly address how this film came to be. Okay, I will try to be brief. <laughs> um, first of all, thank thank you for that question, and thank you, uh, Melissa and Dr. Mann, for being on here and being so open to guide me as a, a member of the White Tribe to find my way through your uh, country and your land and your spiritual practices and being so gracious to allow me to be there as a filmmaker, which I found to be uh, very conflicting with myself because I'm always soul searching and reflecting on who am I to aim the camera and carry the camera. And by the way, I only shot maybe half of the film, maybe two thirds of the film. The rest was uh, through hired um, student filmmakers who came and who were very good. Um, and so that's, that's how it was shot. So my role behind the camera, I always thought was, you tell me what you want to be on camera. You tell me where to aim the camera. And when I first approached Dr. Mann, and this was back in 2011, uh, when Bob and I came out and we were putting together the grant for this whole film, and it was called Building Bridges Indigenous Media, you, Bob, said something that has stuck with me, and that is we are here to sit down elbow to elbow to share stories. And so it wasn't so much uh, as Annette Arkikita, who is our associate uh, producer on this, said she does not like it that you know people come in and observe and interpret who these people are the indigenous people of america who they are they're in, you know trying to interpret what their ceremonies and their spiritual practices mean i did not want to do that at all so behind the camera i wanted uh the and i'm not calling them subjects participants you tell me what your story is, you, you tell me, in, in one of the TP ceremonies, and this was with a, a friend that both Bob and I know, an anthropologist, and I think uh, Wilbur and Melissa also know this person, approached me and said, what do you call me? This was right after an NAC meeting in the morning, we're sitting around inside the TP, and he was kind of challenging me, what do you call me? And I said, I don't know, what, I'll call you whatever you call yourself, and he gave me his name, and. And he said, yeah, but what do you call me? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you call me Native American, right? And I said, I'll call you whatever you want me to call you. And the question came up was, I was asking what tribe? What, what do you identify with? What is your own identity? You tell me what, what your identity is and not the other way around. So it was, uh, that was just one moment in time where I realized that's, that's what I had, the stance that I had to take. And um, so that's that's what I was, was doing there in, in that teepee that day. So um, now getting back to the question, hold on a second. My son is uh, interested in what I'm doing here. Do you want to come say hello, Milo? Okay, I'll talk with you later. You want to say hello? Milo here was, was one of our cinematographers. Come on, you want to be here? Say hi. Hi. He was one of our cinematographers. He's visited everybody, and Bob is Milo's godfather, so he's very much part of this whole, this whole uh, business here. So uh, anyway, getting back to the question, I, as a filmmaker, how do I find myself making this film in terms of authorship? And that comes up as a question a lot, I think, with uh, non-Native people or non-Black people making films about uh, the other race or the other the other uh, cultural traditions and spiritual practices. What is my role? My role is for me to ask them, ask you, you talk, I'll listen. And I'm following Vine Deloria, which I, I read his book when I was uh, just out of high school. And I thought that's what I'm gonna do if ever I'm uh, in Indian country, I'm going to listen. So that's uh, my role. And in this case, not only listen, 
but to aim the camera wherever you want me to aim it. Now, I know with Wilbur, uh, with that one shot with the pipe, uh, the sacred pipe, I asked him, you tell me how you want me to film this. And he did. And, and I think you have to be very, very careful with the camera uh, and respectful and sensitive not to shoot and aim and record things that you're not welcome to shoot. And I think that goes with any culture, but especially in Indian country where, where this, this, uh, these sacred practices, spiritual practices have been, uh, have been stolen. Uh, there's a lot of talk about New Age people stealing the spiritual practices of Native American Indians and selling them in their crystal stores. And, you know, how, where do you show the respect without turning it into a, a commercial commodity, something to sell? And we've, we've seen a lot of that going on where uh, some people are practicing uh, certain ceremonies and getting people to pay a lot of money to come in and participate. And they're not native and they're doing this. So it's, I think it's the same thing with, with making a film uh, about Native American Indians. You have to be just very sensitive and, and respectful and let them tell you what the story is, not vice versa. Thank you, Campbell. Thank you, Campbell. My next My question, next question is for, bo for both, both for Melissa, for Melissa and, and for Dr. Mann. Dr. Mann. And the question is, someone who is not from this world, from this world, the the world of native people of today, you know, people who here in New York, I have to say that most people that I know here don't have the depth of experience to even understand or be able to interpret the events that we're describing in this film. And it's very troubling. It's it's troubling to, to see it, to know that not only were atrocities done in the past, but they continue today. And so the person watching this may ask themselves the question, what do I do about this? How do I respond to this? How do I how do I act in the world in a way that uh, that responds to this in some way. So I'm wondering what kind of advice you have for our non-Indian audience who knows very little about this. What do we do with this, this troubling information? It is most important that each and every one of us understand, understand other people, other people's ways, even understanding other people's language. Uh, my first language is Cheyenne. I am Natista. I am one of the like-hearted people. And I was very fortunate to have my great-grandmother alive when I was born. And her favorite saying was, understanding is a wonderful thing. And that is the exact rationale and the meaning behind the study of Native Americans in the academic institution and programs titled Native American Studies, Indian Studies, Indigenous Studies, because we were here for millions of years before anyone came to share this land with us. And yet we have become so invisible. We are invisible today. It seems as if everyone thinks of everyone else and they completely disregard those of us that were here first who continue to suffer from discrimination, racial inequality, injustice, and unfortunately, what happened to Ma'evis. We too have those problems with police as Native Americans. We managed to survive those three institutions that I mentioned in my prior response, the federal government, the church and education that was aimed at assimilating us and making us into one of the titles of a movie that I had in the white man's image. 
it wanted to completely kill, which was a which was a slogan in those off reservation boarding schools, kill the Indian, but save the man. Man. And so this is an unfortunate part of American history. It is Indian history, but it is a part of the history of our country. If nothing else, we need to read the kind of books that provoke us and, and challenge our minds. Any book of Vine Deloria, any book of N. Scott Marmaday, who won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, of uh, you know, Louise Erdrich, who has just received a Pulitzer Prize this year. There are plenty writings out there where you, that an individual can read for themselves, but to stay informed and remember that all of us are related. We are made of the same four basic elements of life, earth, air, fire, and water every one of us and everything, as Melissa has talked about, that which crawls, that which runs on four legs, that which flies in the air, those people that swim in the ocean, the rooted people, the trees, who are very generous in making sure that we have the kind of oxygen to breathe. And so there is much that we individually have to learn because education has all but excluded us uh, except to mainstream us, assimilate us. This is going to be taking a great deal of responsibility for what you put in your mind to understand this world that many, many are the descendants of the people that came here to live. And so it is a matter of also, once you know the situation, to take action to help, to, to look at the red people of this land, the Kamawa Stanil, and know that we too have voices, that we too have feelings, that we have a history and that we can love and that we are a compassionate, understanding people. I think, unfortunately, history and, and those movies, those Western movies have prevent, presented us as nothing but savage individuals, and we're far from that. And so it takes a great deal of focus, self-focus, to develop one's mind, to look at videos of, of, of this type, to to educate oneself, to, to find the beauty and the tragedy, unfortunate tragedy that we continue to experience and have experienced since the very moment of contact. Wow, what a powerful answer, Dr. Mann. And I would argue that you belong in the same category of native scholars as those, those big leaders that you mentioned. Um, and Scott Mamaday, um, as well as the other the writers that, that you mentioned, I, I would put you right in that same category. So thank you for all that you do for both Native people as well as for non-Natives to, to understand more about the complexity of these issues. And um, I'd like to, for maybe our last couple of minutes, turn it over to Melissa to answer a similar question about what you'd like people to come away with as a result of seeing this and you know, maybe the kind of action that you'd like to see non-Native people take after viewing this. Mm. I think it's a basic, Bob, um, to add anything to um, what Henrietta has said. Assume nothing. As human beings, we're, we're always assuming something. If we can go forth into this life and assume nothing, um, it's better for us. It's better for us. And to always remember something very simple. When you step into someone else's camp, 
depth with respect and compassion. It sounds very simple. It is simple. And it takes a well-trained mind to go forth and spread something wonderful. To emit the change that we all as human beings want to see here on our planet. To treat one another good with respect and compassion and honor. They're simple tools. They're very simple tools. And if we take those simple tools and we go forth after seeing something like this savage land that has been presented this evening, we as one individual can make a positive change in our immediate community, in our workplace, with our children as we raise them and teach them and show them things and to find time in our lives to have a relationship with nature, to sit still and listen to nature, to have a valid relationship with our surroundings, the natural world. As an only child growing up, those were my playmates. That's who I spoke to. That's who I listened to. And I feel that I've gained a lot of strength from those simple tools that I just mentioned. Assume nothing. Walk with reverence and respect whatever camp you step into. Because if you can do that, you're going to receive so beauty in return and knowledge and wisdom in return and love and fulfillment in return everything happens for a reason there is a higher purpose for everything the horrific things the joyful things the births of new things it's how we, as human beings, take it and how we utilize it and what we do with it. And if I can add anything to what Henrietta has said, it would be what I've just shared. Just walk simply, mindfully. And remember, have a well-trained mind. And be respectful of every camp you step into. With compassion and love. And doors will open. Positive changes will happen. And good things are yet to come. That's the message of my events. Good things are yet to come. Well done. Thank you. Well, thank you for such a, a kind and loving response on from someone, especially following the, the film, you know, someone who could be embittered. And yet what you've shared with us is a, a lesson of kindness, kindness and love and compassion. So thank you, Melissa. Yes, thank you. Um, Henrietta, I, I wanted to ask you, one question about when we go back to what you had to say about the boarding schools, the irony in our conversation has to do with the type of education that Carlisle intended. You know, Pratt through the Carlisle Institute, you know, he had this idea of kill the Indian to save the man and wanted to completely eradicate all of these traditional cultures, all of the hundreds of beautiful societies and cultures that lived here. And somehow it, it backfired. You know, it, it backfired in the sense that, that, as you said so brilliantly before, you said that we're still here. 
meaning that we still have these cultures that are intact, cultures that understand who you are and how you fit in the world. And I think of your life in many ways as such an incredible inspiration because when I look at some of the social ills that I see in Indian country, some of the tragedies that we see with people who are stuck somewhere in between two cultures that are diametrically opposed, you, Dr. Mann, learned in the highest way about both ways, about your Cheyenne life, as well as the world of the non-Indian in academia. And I consider that such an inspiration. And I was wondering if you could just comment on what it's like to be poised in between those two diametric opposites and to use education in the way that you have, uh, not only for yourself, but to inspire so many other people. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Melissa Goodblanket, who too is a doctor and walks with grace and love in her life, despite the kind of unfortunate experience that, that she has had with power, with institutions. And so I am, um, I have to say that I was born in 87 years ago in 1934 and I was among the generation that no longer had that connection to the bison or the horse. My great grandmother who uh, was a midwife uh, lived long enough to see me and hold me in my arms and dedicate, I'm sure, my life to serving the people in the baby ceremony, pipe ceremony that she had for me. There was never any question about my getting an education because those of my generation were seen as essentially bridges between cultures. Their identity as American Indian nations, and, and we have a, a nationhood, believe me, Otherwise, why did the United States of America sign 400 or so treaties with us? Because we're sovereign nations, okay? So we have that kind of sovereignty, identification, national background, and because we saw that the world was changing and our ancestors are completely... Uh, in sync with change, they knew that the seasons come and go and that they change four times before they come back to the point of beginning, if you want to say. And so we, there, those of us of my generation and those that went to the Carlisles and the 25 other off-reservation boarding schools were seen in that way to be those bridges. That was what we called between our world and the new world that had come to us through immigration, through, through people who found our land in 1492. And I am so glad that now we are having Indigenous Peoples Days rather than Christopher Columbus Day. But you, you know those people that have the right kind of heart. And I would like to say that you, my little brother, who my aunt and my uncle adopted, my, my baby mother, represent that kind of respect for how we are. And then it took one, but one step when Campbell came to the Cheyenne and Arapaho Tribal College with his students. And we began this journey to document the histories of the 39 nations within the state of Oklahoma and came the tragedy. Our one instance of injustice that Campbell has captured in this video, Savage 
land. This was not a savage land until others from other parts of the world found us. And when we stop and think of today, I, I, I live a life of service, and that is what I believe my great-grandmother prayed for me to do. I educate the children. I educate, would love to just educate Ayers and Native American studies, but I educated a lot of the non-Indian students in my college and university classrooms. But the biggest joy I have today in terms of the way that I live is having seven wonderful, handsome, and beautiful young Cheyennes as junior apprentices in our tribal language program. And I am one of their masters. I have an obligation and commitment to the people to whom I belong not only in a spiritual sense, but in a lifelong way. I have the responsibility of educating those children, but I also have the educate responsibility of educating those that do not come from our cultures. And you and Campbell, but through this, this film, have shown that you understand and that you understand well and that you walk with humility and you walk with a sense of justice. And I wish the West, rest of the world was like you too. Then I would not have had to see my little sister suffer the way that she did. And the fight goes on. It didn't stop. It continues, and we all have to be very proactive about racial justice, justice from those that are in control. Today, I am happy, very happy on one point, because we are celebrating the victory of the Lakota, the Cheyenne, and Arapaho at the Little Bighorn. Yes. Custer. George Armstrong Custer, who rode into Black Kettle's camp in 1868 and massacred the people to whom I belong. On the other hand, I also sat and watched the verdict that was handed down in Minnesota about a policeman who killed one of our relatives, a black man that we all witnessed in a video. I would hope that we can understand and learn to speak from my heart to your heart and your heart to mine. We have to think not only with the mind, but we have to bear, think with the heart, both of them. We have to be loving, compassionate individuals. We also have to be very firm about this overwhelming need of the United States of America to extend racial justice to every brown, black, yellow person on this land and those that don't rise to the standards that the wealthy honor. Well, thank you for Thank you for all of that, Henry. And um, I guess the the one thing that m maybe we'll touch on next is I think uh, that there are probably people who are very surprised to learn through the, the film that Indian people, American Indians are much more, are the most likely group of people to be killed in an altercation with police. You know, we've, We've seen so much in the last year, uh, so much has been brought to light about the conflict between police and, and African-Americans. But I think most people have no, in our country have absolutely no idea of this, the problem as it exists in Indian country. And, um, you know, I would turn it over to, to both of you, to Melissa and Dr. Mann to, to kind of comment on, on that. 
um, and and about bringing it out in the the movie as well. I'll yield to my younger sister at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh you know Marvitz came back several times after his death with messages not just for us his family but for humanity one of those messages was something like this I know I left you too soon but it was my destiny. What happened to me will continue to escalate across this planet until people rise as one. That's what he said, my events. People say, how can you accept that? How can I not accept? the message straight from the spirit who says it was my destiny and that's the way it has been since 2013 there was no one rallying no one standing up people were afraid to stand up when this happened but we stood up we stood up we talked to the VIPs. Okay. We went up to the state capitol. And all of it was a very strong learning experience for me because I realized that there were so many humans that were walking without compassion, without respect, the same things that I keep talking about. My eyes were wide open when the other murders happened and we're sitting at home watching television and people are rising up. I was glad for that. But at the same time, I was wondering why? What about my son? Hmm? So this was in 2013, the sacred time of the year, winter solstice, the longest night of the year, literally, for my family and I. Takes us back to Sand Creek. Takes us back to the Trail of Tears, takes us back, takes us back, takes us back, and then here we are, all the way forward to 2021. But as I understand it, you know, the darkness has to be seen clearly before the light can come and stamp it out. And that's what's happening across this country. People are realizing their eyes are opening, their hearts are opening, they're seeing with their own eyes what's going on and what has been going on. And yes, it continues. But each of us can make a positive difference. We can make a difference in our families, our communities. We can take our talents, our gifts, and use them for the greater good of all. I just want to thank you, Bob, and thank you, Campbell. Thank you, Sister Henrietta for all of your efforts throughout all of these years and that people can now witness and see and be a part of the story. It can be told. 
past histories can be told and we can restore for the future generations. We can plant the seeds of peace and hope and harmony and balance for all of us. Through Savage Land. And our family still waits. We still stand and we still wait for justice. In our case, we still wait for the truth to be told. We still await. Officers who were given medals of valor for killing our son, an 18-year-old young man with this future ahead of him. We want to see those recanted. We want to see all those responsible, held accountable. We want the world to see and know what we see and know to be truth here. And we call for the Justice Department, Washington, D.C., to come and take a look at the state of Oklahoma and the atrocities that are happening here, the injustices that are happening here, the racism that is systemic The training, the lack of training. So my voice calls out to the Justice Department of the United States to take a look, not just at my bits and what happened here, but yes, take a real good look at it. Take a look at the state of Oklahoma. Investigate the entire state of Oklahoma. And to each and every one of you who are watching, who watch the film, you can make a difference. Your voice counts. Your heart and your compassion counts. Your life is important. Just as mine, Henry Edis, Bob's, Campbell's, my bit. Our children and our grandchildren their life matters. The future generations who are yet unborn, their life matters. So each and every one of us, we have keys, we have wheels and keys and knowledge and wisdom that we can plant to make a difference for the here and the now and the days to come, the years to come. Because we are a dog, a stick, one. All life matters. Well, thank you, Melissa, for a, a message for, I think, all of humanity. I think that's a, a message that the entire world should hear. And I thank you so much for being here and and sharing that with us. So on behalf of our, our little team here um, representing Savage Land, I want to say a big thank you to Taffney for giving us this platform, this first place to show this film. And my hope is that the message in it is one that gets to be spread far and wide. So thank you so much, Taffney, for, for being the first ones to air this, this film. And thank you to our wonderful co-presenters here tonight. Thank you, Campbell. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Dr. Mann. And thanks, everybody out there for watching tonight. We appreciate it. Yeah, check it out on November 1st on PBS. We hope you'll tell all your friends about it as well. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
Love you. Good night. <laughs> and I love our audience. Thank you. Yes. We do love our audience. Yes. Yes. Come come again.